Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 17, verse 3, and 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 through 23. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. This is the word of God. A few years ago, somebody asked me, um, do I experience miracle in my life? So I said, all the time. Uh, and he said, I've been in church many, many years, but I've never seen miracle healing in my life. I said, how poor are you? Um, and I said, is there any way to experience miracles? I said, of course. And uh, this is about 30 years ago. So, you know, I, I, t I actually uh, did a sermon on how to experience uh, the hand of God. And uh, so I'm going to start uh, today uh, this kind of similar topic. And I'll call it, um, in uh, counterintuitive ways, uh, counterintuitive path to a blessed life. And uh, I'm going to talk about a few things uh, as we go on. So today, um, it's kind of foundational. You know, you need to kind of have your expectation in the right uh, direction and um, really have this desire to really experience God. Um, you know, like uh, we had a food pantry late yesterday in the NIM campus and, um, you know, seven, eight people came to know the Lord, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, but there are a couple of miracles as well. We actually average-wise three to five uh, healings uh, each time we do it and um, one of the uh, like a couple of weeks ago we had a man with a broken elbow and wouldn't heal for a whole year uh, and uh, one of our guys uh, asked can I pray for you and uh, right he's praying he just fused right there his arm was and all that as a result he accepted Jesus you know uh, and and things like that do happen and um, I want you to be in the thick of all this and uh, experience that. Otherwise, uh, our faith become really mundane, boring, and burdensome. Right? I see some of your faces. Uh, yeah. So I want to talk about blessed life. And it starts with personal relationship with God. And not an impersonal religion. And in fact, Jesus... Um, you know, uh, Jesus actually um, uh, defines it in such a way, all right? So, um, let me see, my, my pad is acting up for some reason, uh, so let me try to re redo it. At my age, I forget to say what I need to say, and so, and then... After that, after we are done with the prayer, I think, oh, I should have said that. I, I, <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, so, <clears throat> and Jesus said this. This is eternal life. This is a blessed life. That is, that you come to know God and his son, Jesus Christ. This is the crux of all things. It's not like you die and go to heaven or whatever else. The eternal life, the blessed life that lasts forever is the fact that you come to know God. And this word in Greek is a ginese, gineso, and in Hebrew is yada. The interesting thing is, these Hebrew and Greek, they both use this word know as experiential know, not just knowledge, con conceptual, experiential. Not only that, intimate knowledge. In fact, they use both language, Greek and Hebrew, both use it as a, a you know, a connotation for sexual relationships. So like 
Adam knew Eve and had their son, right? They, they, they are intimate knowledge. It's that intimate. And this is, what, this is the way that Jesus is using it. He says, the eternal life, the secret of blessed life, is in the fact that you have intimate relationship with God, that you walk with God and humbly in a very personal way, and, and that's where the happiness and blessedness is locked in. And that's what he's talking about. It's not an organized religion such as this. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. The organized religion, like our, our church and all that, is there to help you to keep that personal relationship. Right? So, now, um, the impersonal of, of faith is very dangerous. And in fact, today, we're going to talk about Saul, the first king of Israel, versus uh, David, the second king. And the first king was rejected because he couldn't switch from practicing religion to having a personal relationship with God. And that's how he was rejected. And the thing is, as we uh, uh, begin this, uh, this campus and we have a, a lot of people come in and join us and all that, and sometimes expectation is all, all over the place. And, and business as usual or, or their assumption about faith and religion and all that, and we want to kind of clear that right here because we, we are not here to practice religion, right? And we want our lifestyle to be, um, to, to be changed so that we may walk humbly before God. We want to have a relationship with God. We want our spiritual life to be alive and thriving, and that's why. So... Uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, clear uh, in the uh, biblical accounts that God demands nothing short of personal relationship based on our trust in God and His promises, His words. Right? He wants us to trust Him, love Him. And that's why uh, He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And love the Lord your God with you know, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and all that is, Love your God. That is the first and foremost command. It's not being in the program. It's not going through the steps. But it is where the relationship is. This is where you hear God. This is where you experience miracle. This is where your, your spirit is rejuvenated and your mind is renewed. Your focus is clear. Your, your, there's a transformation of life happens. That's where you experience God. And there's joy. And such joy that comes from it. However, problem is, this relationship takes so much energy and time. And because of that, there's an incredible temptation to reduce God into a small religion that we can control. Uh, we can, you know, uh, put it on the shelf when we need to and pick it up when we need to type of things happen. Um, Scott Peck, a Harvard-trained psychiatrist and the taught at uh, Yale Divinity School, he said this, the essence of evil is laziness. And that is so true. And the people who will you know, uh, exert so much energy and time in their career or hobbies and whatever else, when it comes to God, um, they become so lazy. Uh, and and they, they have this, the temptation of re reducing God into something that's controllable. And that will never happen. But people do all the time. And that's why we, we have our crutches as a religion you know, church program, we go through this and that and that and that, and, and then therefore we are done, uh, like, you know, going to EG or going to short-term mission or something, and therefore to pat myself and say, I'm doing something good. And, and all the while, the touch of God is missing. Uh, and that's where the problem lies, right? So, uh, this, uh, there is an incredible pressure to just practice impersonal religion. That's what I'm trying to say. 
And so if we are not alert and, and, and uh, aware of ourselves, we are carried by the current and, and, and just practice religion. We become audience, we become onlookers rather than worshipers, rather than children of God who walk humbly before God. I, I share that in our church. At my age, I'm producing too much estrogen, all right? And so I, I, I become touchy-feely person now, and I want to get involved with my son's life, right? You know, what are you doing? You know, where? Are they? And they don't let me do that anymore, you know, like. And when I was young, I, you know, you know like, they have their own life, I have my life, you know, all that. And now uh, I want to get involved with them, you know. You know, can you imagine how much God wants to get involved with our lives? And, and what pleasure it brings to him that, that you open up your life and invite him and open access that he'll speak to you and you respond. That's where the blessedness, in fact, that's why we are created in the first place. We are created by him and for him. For his good pleasure. And we are given the image of God so that we can reciprocate his love. And that's where the blessedness is locked in. And so many people miss this out. Because this is where we touch God and God touches us. So God's graceful invitation of an abundant life and of excellent adventure become a mere set of doctrines and rituals in an impersonal religion. And that's what we prefer many times. And so here, in, in this, in this uh, point of history, um, you know, Israel went through a lot, and uh, you know, judges, different judges came, Gideon and Samson, and these kind of people led in you know, a very ragtag way, you know, uh, uh, ad hoc. And, and then Samuel comes, and Samuel is first de facto king, priest, prophet. And uh, he, was, he was hearing from the Lord, and he was directing this God's people, Israel, and, and all that. And people said, hey, um, you know, we love you, but it's not enough. We, we, we want king like anybody else around us, right? And we want a king. We want our system, right? And so uh, God gives, him, uh, gives Israel... Um, Saul, King Saul, uh, in, in Hebrew, Saul. And then, so, but Saul is of old school. He's my, he doesn't know God. He just heard about God. And, uh, you know, uh, he got into this job of leading the people of the covenant. God's people. He didn't understand that job. This group of people, this ragtag as they may be, but throughout their history, they have defeated armies 100 times bigger than them by the miracles of God. Now, now Saul was given an opportunity to lead these precious people in the sight of the Lord, even though they don't look much at the time. So therefore, he needs to approach life in an entirely different way as a leader. But he failed to do so, right? Um, so his mind his, is always a religion, religion, just a religion. So in his mind is a formula. The problem with a religion is we always have this doctrinal setting as if to uh, uh, distill God into this formula or equation and, and so that we can have a handle on God, so to speak. So now, in his mind is, if I do sacrifice before the battle, the, guar the guarantee of, of victory, right? The victory is guaranteed. That's normal religious thinking. So this is a story. Now, the Saul was facing an enemy on, on the other side of the hill. So there's a, they're on a hill, and there's a ravine, and there's a, another hill. And the, he can see the enemy is gathering, amassing, and also his, his army, a ragtag army of Israelites, because they are not really organized. And this army is actually shrinking. People, 
you know, it's like obvious. You're, you're on this hill, you're looking on the other hill. The, the other hill is disciplined, they're better equipped, and there are so many people, and you look at yourself, oh, you're not much, and people are going home, basically. So it's shrinking on this side, and the, the other one is getting bigger and bigger, and the, uh, the Samuel, who promised that he's going to show up uh, to do the sacrifice, is not showing up. So he thought, okay, I don't need to wait for Samuel, so I, I'm going to, because sacrifice is important, I'm going to do the sacrifice, and we're going to go before it's too late, and then when, when we do that, we'll get the victory. That's a mindset. That's the religious mindset. As long as I show up in the church, as long as I, I go, you know, a short-term mission or do this, Bible study and all that, I'm set, kind of thing. And that is not how God moves in our lives. And the people with that kind of mindset always miss out. And they can be in the church for decades. And they can be in the ministry for decades. And yet, they have a mindset of Saul, this formula. This equation, very impersonal. But God is personal God. That's where the problem is, right? And God demands more than ritual and doing all that. And uh, the brother Juan uh, did um, uh, you know, testimony today. And uh, for him to experience God and the community of faith, that's a real thing. And, you know, today we have a celebration for men. And uh, if you're not part of it, you're missing a great opportunity to come and experience God in this, in this setting. Right? And, and so um, Saul fails in the most fundamental uh, test as a, as a leader. Because this group of people are not... Over, even though they look racked, I mean, they're not organized, they're not much, and they're shrinking, they're undisciplined, right? And, and, and yet, this is a group of people God has blessed over the years, and they have overcame the enemies that's 100 times bigger. And they, they, God used them for miracles and all that. And yet, Saul did not realize this. And because of that, he treated God as a mere, you know, like another deity or idol. Uh, and, and just went through this ritualistic thing without waiting for him. I'll explain this later. You know, when I first read this uh, text um, years ago, I was thinking, what's wrong with this? You know, Samuel didn't show up in time, and there's an enemy to fight. Of course he should do all that and do that, but as I grow in faith, I realize this. You know, God's timing is always late. God's timing is always later than what you expect. And, and, and it's not just here, everywhere. There's a reason for that. And God always asks us to do something we cannot do physically, like defeating this well-trained, well-equipped enemy when you have a ragtag people. When I say ragtag, they didn't have weapons. Saul, was, Saul and Jonathan were only ones with actually sword because they didn't have a blacksmith. They, they're, actually, they came out with a farming equipment, basically. The armies over there is well equipped and they're trained. So it is it is very understandable that he did what he did. But when you understand the history of God and the person of God and the way he moves, then it's all an entirely different story. You have to understand, God shows up every time later than what we think. Because he has other things in mind. And that I'm going to share with you later on. Now, faith uh, is based on personal relationship. 
And we must resist the temptation of reducing God in a magical formula, sometimes just religious rituals. And that's something that is unacceptable to God. Faith must be placed in the person of Jesus Christ, God's own son. And there are some people, even within Christianity, they try to say faith in faith. If there are some people called faith teachers. And, and as long as you have faith, you can do this. And No, it's not. It's not true. And the faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And faith in faith itself, or faith in impersonal religion, is not truly faith that God honors. So fa formula-based faith frequently results in derailing the fulfillment of God's promise. This is another place, another Samuel chapter 14. We are at 15 now. And 14, this is what Saul did. There was another battle. And this battle, God told uh, Saul to just wipe them out. And then just kind of gave to them, so to speak. And, um, and uh, Saul, in his own religiosity, he proclaims fast in the battle. Now that's foolishness because in you know in ancient battle battle is a whole day affair. Sometimes it runs to two three days, and people are running all over the place, very physically demanding. They're dehydrated, adrenaline <laughs> pumping, <coughs> and people are exhausted uh, in, in this warfare. And, and yet, and he proclaimed fast <coughs> once again his mindset of fast plus battle victory this formula again this religious thinking so he he goes and he proclaims fast and the while the animal uh, the enemy is drinking and eating uh, between the fights and all that kind of stuff and the the soldiers of Israel were <coughs> under ban so they could not drink or eat now the men of Israel were hard pressed on that day for Saul had put people under oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening, and until I have avenged myself or my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. And this is foolishness. And this is what religion makes us do. And that is out of their own religiosity. And they, they have these rules and regulations and make people suffer for no good reason. You know? So Jonathan, his son, wasn't there when Saul was saying this. So Jonathan, uh, you know, uh, w when he was engaged in the battle in the other place, and he, he, had, uh, he found honey, and he ate honey, and he got more energy, and he was able to fight uh, much better. But the result is this, uh, and, and they were supposed to wipe them out. They couldn't. They defeated them, but they couldn't wipe them out because they are exhausted. Not only that, when the, when the soldiers came back home, came back to the tent, uh, their camp, they slaughtered uh, the animal, like uh, oxen or sheep and whatever else. They begin to devour them with the blood in them. See, it, it's very important in Hebrew faith and Jewish faith. You have to drain all the blood according to the rules of Leviticus so that it will be kosher for them to, for them to consume. But... Soldiers are so tired, so hungry, and all that. They came and they slaughtered the animal and eat that. You actually, what Saul did was to cause them to sin. And this type of, that happens quite often in church settings. Sometimes we are so driven by the fact, uh, you know, this and that and that. Uh, and, and um, you know, because we are not hearing from the Lord. There's no intimate relationship with God. It's just practicing religion. And, and that's where everything falls apart. And, and people uh, find themselves outside the sphere of God's blessing because they're merely practicing faith. Now, um, and, and, and when you look at it even more closely, and why? was Saul so uh, bent on this religious mindset rather than personal relationship with God. The greatest reason in, in, in Saul's life is that he had a fear of men. 
And this fear of man caused him to fall over and over again. Let me say this. Uh, this uh, rel, uh, reverent love of God, that's fear, fear of God. And the fear of man are inversely related to one another. What I mean by that is when the, love of God, when the fear of God goes up, the fear of man goes down. When the fear of man goes up, fear of God goes down. And they are related in this way. And it doesn't go up together or go down together. It's always inversely related. So when, when you walk with God and experience God's power and anointing, and you become intimate with God in the relationship, your fear for man will diminish automatically. Vice versa. If the fear of man dominates your life, then there is no room for fear of God. And it's always the case. So more love and fear I have for God, and the less fear I have men, uh, for men. And so uh, this is where, where uh, you know, uh, he talks about this as well. Just as he finished making the offering, the Saul that is, Saul uh, couldn't wait for uh, Samuel, so he made the offering. Samuel arrived, and, and Saul went out to greet him. And what have you done? Asked Samuel. Uh, uh, Saul replied, uh, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the uh, set time, the Philistines were assembling a mishmash. And then he said, uh, yeah, this is w what I did because you didn't show up and all that. Now, as I said before, God shows up always later than what we have expected. God always asks us to do something beyond what we are capable on our own. If you heard any preacher say, God will never ask you to do something that you cannot do, that's a lie. The scripture is filled with it. God tells uh, uh, the Israelites, face an enemy there like 10 times, 100 times bigger than they. And, and you know, he always asks to cross the river uh, the, or, or ocean and all that things that we cannot do because he wants to show who he is to us that we may understand that we may walk with him in that way and, and this is very important that we obey him in the areas that we think is impossible when he says it recognizing his voice and that's where the excitement and, and the wonder and the blessing comes and if you do not engage in there, then your God is limited by your own imagination and set. You have not experienced God in this way. The same way, when God shows up late, that's where your faith is challenged. You're going to wait for him because of his word, or you're going to have your own option kick in and do it. There are people who always have many options. You know what, what it, the definition of spiritual man, spiritual woman, is man or woman without options. They have, they have got rid of all the options, but to but only God. And that's what Elisha did. When he was called by God, he killed all the oxen that he was plowing with, and he burned uh, the plow as a fire for, for uh, sacrifice. He just burned the bridge. I'm not going back to this, right? And so that kind of, that kind of faith, that, that experience with God is what is needed. Now, from the fleshly, look, uh, fleshly viewpoint, that's not wise. You need to have an option. You, know, you need to have you know, other way. What if God doesn't do and all that? And that's where you completely miss out God's provision and miracle because you took care of yourself. Now, provide that you have heard God right, right? But this is where the intimacy comes from. And this is where, where the labor of prayer, waiting on the Lord, and all that is being, being cashed right here. But people don't want to do that, and they just want to experience something. This is, once again, this is why laziness is the very essence of evil and wickedness. And that's why... You know, the whole lot of people coming out of church all the time. But rarely 
rarely, very few, you know, the people who experience God in a noticeable way uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that that's enough to change our lifestyle and, and all that. It's very rare. And people that I can call, you're truly blessed, are very few. Because we cannot wait. Because we'll cower away from what we deem impossible. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, our faith rises to such state that we are beyond uh, the uh, intimidation of challenge, challenging circumstances or powerful people in our lives. So we are filled with, so filled with God, there's no room left for fear of men. And that's where we must be. That's where, where the blessing is. And the people who wonder, I have never seen miracle. I have never been, you know, so blessed or all that. There's a reason for that. Because you, you navigated your life in such a way, you missed out everything. You meander through life and missed out what God has prepared for you. Sometimes we do it out of our own righteousness. When God didn't call it, we, we out of our religious thinking that we got to do this like Saul. And we completely miss out what God has a plan to. This is why it's a delicate walk with God. It takes serious, serious faith. You know, and the finally, uh, when, 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 you know, Samuel confronted and Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people and so I give in to them, gave in to them. Does that sound like repentance to you? Actually, it's not repentance. It's blaming someone else. I was afraid. He was right up to that point. But he's a leader who had to move people from A to B in a very challenging circumstances. He cannot afraid, afford to be afraid of people, number one. And he cannot be blaming people. This is not a, 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 a repentance, I'll tell you. Because the fear of man dominated his life. And there are people here, even, your career choices, your lifestyle, you know, whatever else, expectation of other people hem you in so that you cannot make a choice and decision as a man of God or woman of God. And this is what is most expected of you as a parent. This is what is expected of you as a man uh, in, you know, uh, in Southern California, whatever. And we, we are more willing to fit into that than what, we, what is expected of us as, as a man of God or woman of God. That's a fear of man. And many of us are dominated by that in our behaviors. The mere religion does not have the power to replace fear with faith. You know, um, uh, I shared it uh, in, in, I guess, this Friday with, with an EEG group uh, in Anaheim. Um, there, there was a man, it, this happened about a little less than 30 years ago, uh, and I was doing an EG with people. And by the way, uh, if you are in the EG group, um, you know, this week, walk with God is a very important thing that you need to do. Uh, that's, uh, you know, spending time uh, listening to God and, um, you know, all that. So those of you who are doing that, you, you know uh, what I'm talking about. So... I had this, this man, uh, and a group of people, but particularly this man, uh, just walk with God and write down what, whatever God is saying. And uh, he's a very smart man, and uh, uh, top schools and all that, and, and he was at the time as a medical student and all that. And he said, um, you know, I, I told him actually do it every day for him. You know, so take 30 minutes every day and walk with God and write that down and, and all that. And so he came back, and so... How is it going? He said, I'm not doing this anymore. Said, Why? He said, I think I'm making this up. 
I'm not hearing anything from God. I'm making this up. So what, what, what have you been getting? And he says, every time I walk, God says, I love you. That's all. So I think I'm making this up, so I'm not going to do this anymore. So, you know, but normally this is not a wisdom that I have all the time, but I, I think God gave me a wisdom uh, um, at the time, says, you know what, um, I think that's what you need to hear. You are not hearing it, that God loves you. That's why God is repeating that in your life, but you are not hearing it. Somehow, that went through him like the bolt of lightning. He just broke down and cried. The thing is this, ever since he was a child, he had a serious eczema problem. So uh, whenever he sleeps and he you know, scratches himself, in the morning, is bloody and scabs and scars all over the place. His face was never clean. He was, you know, um, his limbs and all that. So he remembers as a child, he went to this, uh, you know, the sandbox where kids are playing, and he sat in one corner, and kids moved away from him. And he felt kind of, you know, as a little kid, this, I, I don't know, he was like four or five years old, and he felt so rejected and dejected, so she, he came out of the sandbox, came over to his, where his mom is in the bench and sat down, and the, the other boys came back and filled that space and playing. As a very smart kid, he realized, okay, if I'm going to be in the group, I have to outdo, outperform every time. So he was an excellent student. He just outperformed everybody. Top school, top school, top school, and, and uh, all that. And you know, even in church, you know, let's say we, we have like Easter, we are fasting three days. He'll fast five days, just to make sure, right? He outdoes everybody. He signed up for everybody and all that kind of stuff. So when, when God told him, I love you, now cut it out, that's but I added in there. <laughs> you know, I love you already. And that's how he understood in that moment. It's not like I don't have to earn his love. I don't have to prove I'm more serious. And I, you know, I, I don't have to earn and deserving this. That God loves me as I am. That sank it in that moment. That changed him. You know what? After a couple of days, I met him. His face cleared up. And I, I think, you know, I have another part of the story I, I tell another time in EG setting. But I think, for the first, and he told me this, for the first time, he slept like baby after that, continually. And, and the thing is that that fear of rejection, that fear of men and, and missing out and all this, all of a sudden, the peace just came over like waves and, and put, him, uh, put serenity in his life, right? And, and that changed everything. You know, you talk about healing and all that miracle, this is a miracle. And something that was so stuck in his life, this frozen emotion, and it's, it's just done in an instant. Because why? The voice of God. That's why the intimate faith and relationship has the power to change. But if I stand here as a pastor until my face gets blue, God loves you. Do you think it's going to make a difference like that in your life? I say, oh yeah, I heard that before. This, you have to hear from God yourself. And, and that's why the, the religion doesn't have power. Program itself doesn't have power. You have to have the relationship with Him. And the relationship cannot be sustained without prayer. And I'm going to talk about that some other, uh, uh, some other in, in this series. And this fear of man is not just uh, that you are, you are pressured to do uh, uh, certain things. Actually, this fear of man manifests in a, in a great need to be recognized and loved by people. This people-pleasing attitude is not just fear of man, but people-pleasing attitude. 
And this, this goes far beyond you know, what, we, what we think it is. It is a pervasive in our lives. That's why we buy things we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people we don't like. Right? Uh, 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 so that's, that's why our lives are so uh, uh, you know, disengaged in many ways. It, we, we make choices and behaviors and that is contrary to what is actually beneficial to us because of fear of men. And so here, the people-pleasing orientation and, and the fear of men, and for, particularly for a Saul, and he missed out completely in personal relationship with God. Now, uh, oops, sorry. So here, um, this is the story right before. Now, Samuel came late partly because Saul's been moving around. So this is a kind of a, a window of a picture here. So 1 Samuel 15, 12 says, Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. Um, there he set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. You see, Saul's been busy building monument for himself. You know, he want to recognize himself. He want to be accepted by people. He want to be loved by people, and, and that drove him more than anything else. And this is why some of the reasons that Samuel was late as well. So here, the next thing is when Samuel shows up, and Samuel replied, "This does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord?" To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion, disobedience, that is, in, in for, uh, impersonal religion that makes us disobey God in this way, is like a sin of divination, and arrogance is like the evil of idol idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. This is serious talk. God has rejected Saul as king because he operated out of the fear of men. He, he wanted to reduce God into impersonal religion. And because of that, God has rejected him. But Saul couldn't even repent properly. As I said before, you know, so I have sinned doesn't mean anything. Because he said, another place he said this, Paul rep uh, the Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people, before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord, your God. Right? He said, okay, 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 God rejected me, so okay. All right, take that. All right? And then, but in front of the elders and the Israel, act as if nothing happened. Right? And then I'll come and worship your God. Right? There's no personal relationship with God. There's nothing in, in his life. There are a whole bunch of people in church are like this. They're into this formula, this convenient religion, and just practice, go through the ritual without any heart in it. And thinking that something will change. It doesn't change. In fact, the motive of obey is better than sacrifice run through Old Testament. Again and again. And, and to be in, in trust relationship with God, to obey regardless of our, our protest and excuse, is far more acceptable to uh, God than merely mechanically observing the rituals. And this is so important, brothers and sisters. Therefore, do not just show up at church. Prepare yourself before you come. Expect something to happen that you hear the voice of God. Higher expectation. Prepare yourself. Right? In every given time, any given time, 
God can intervene in your life because God, God desires to speak to you and God desires to push the envelope. Not to make your life miserable, but because He wants to experience this incredible ride of joy and excitement. Are you excited? You know, don't lie to me, right? <laughs> I don't, you are not excited. In fact, many of you are bored. Ask yourself why. This generation has been provided the most. We are educated the highest so far. We have the convenience of this and that and that. And how come our lives lack joy and excitement and adventure and all that brings joy and happiness? Why? Because your life is not blessed. Why? Because you are missing out what God is doing. Why? Because you are not doing what God says to do, which appears impossible to you. Because you had option A, B, C, D to Z when God doesn't show up. And the people of God, people of God who really experience God and living in the blessed, this is another word for abundant life that you just promised comes only when the time is over. It only happens over time. It only happens when you're done with all your resources, your strength, and all that imagination, all that is spent. It happens afterwards. Because that's where God moves. In your comfort zone, you cannot experience God. And so this is very, very exciting when your faith is stepping out. You know, have you ever imagined, you know, you, you, re you remember the story when Jesus is walking on the water in the stormy um, Sea of Galilee. And, and these this, uh, this disciples in the boat, white knuckled and holding on to that little boat going back and forth. And, and, and and Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus says, to come. Can you imagine this? He must be about 50, mid-50 year, you know, 50 uh, years old. And, and he's, he's been, he lived his life in this, in this small lake. We call it Sea of Galilee, but it's the closest two mile and seven mile uh, Part. This is surrounded by mountain. It's not impressive at all, right? And he lived his 50 years of his life. He fished there. We know he has two houses, uh, Capernaum and, and, and Bethsaida. And he's a successful businessman. So he's on this side, on this side. He knows the water inside out. He spent all his life in there, but he has never walked on that water. And Jesus says in this stormy night, pitch dark and he says come and, and can you just just imagine this this rocking boat uh, everybody's holding on to it tight and this guy had guts enough to put his leg out and his sole of his feet is touching the cold water for the first time in his life and the water is supporting him can you see the excitement and fear that go through his his life that is what faith meant to be in our lives. You know, it, the problem of our life is, in, especially in the Western world and Southern California, is we try to make our life so predictable. You know, by the time when you retire, and, and in, I don't know, probably young people, you'll never retire in this economy. But, the, you know, let's say for some old guys, you know, uh, 67 now or 70, you know, and, and then you're going to buy an RV and drive up and down Florida, and that's, that's, that's your dream, and that's, that's the predictive lifestyle that you want to have? That will just sap you out. And, uh, you know, uh, I, actually, my wife and I are leaving tonight to go to Guatemala. Uh, the only reason is to visit Elder John and Isho, uh, who just got rid of their practice by hearing the voice of God. And uh, 
who's left to follow him. I'm not saying everybody has to go to mission. That's not what I'm saying. But isn't that crazy and exciting? That's life. You know, I, I meet this type of people all over the world. But the people who are only wanting to be convenient and comfortable and slowly dying, there's no hope, there's no joy, there's no happiness, there's no blessedness, there's no miracles. Only thing is what you have expected, paycheck to paycheck. And that's, that's life, that we are designed for that. The Son of God, the God of the universe died, bled for us so that we may live predictable life. And that's not what it is. And so Jesus, the cross, is a symbol for many things. It sacrifice, God's love, forgiveness, but most importantly, it's obedience. Cross symbolizes obedience. Not my will, but yours be done. This is where the joy of walking with God happens. Right? And you lose control. And you're controlled by God. You know, some pastor said this story. When we become a, a baby Christian, we become Christian when, when we're babies, God gives us a little bell. And then ding, 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 ding. And God comes and, and you know, uh, answers our prayer and takes care of us. You know, like waiter. Would. But as we grow a little bit and God takes away it, our bell, and he rings a bell. And we come and do his bidding, right? That's how we grow. That's where the blessing is. But, you know, people who've been in church for so long, they still want to hold on to this bell, and I'm not giving it, you know, you know, and kind of thing. And we're missing out this rich relationship, the abundance in Christ Jesus. And so when, when Christ died for us on the cross, it's not his will, but the will of his Father will be done. Even that is an example for us to follow. Now, and this, um, you know, David, after sin, uh, sinning, uh, he says this as well. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I'll bring it. Okay? You, you are not in this plastic religion business. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. And David understood exactly what God wants. It's not the religion, it's not the rituals, but it is actually walking with God and his heart being removed by it. And true obedience happens when our hearts move. True relationship with God results in deep trust and obedience. On the same note, the rebellion and that is disobedience is not only negative, but it's offensive to God. Right? Merely practicing religion is an offense to God because it is an effort to manipulate God and his benefits, which is basically the occult, what occult is. Shamanism is that, using the power of the deity to get your will done, your wish done. And some, sometimes Christianity, some people say, well, if I do this and that, um, I will, will have, we'll, be, we'll live as a cancer free or something, or our children will get, you know, uh, you know not get infected by drugs or whatever, or, or they go to good school. And they're kind of a, a very simplistic and, and undefined expectations and benefits of God. That's not why we come to believe God. We believe in God because it's true. We believe in God because he has a kind intention toward us. And he is in control. Therefore, what's the takeaway? Is God, this is EG, experiencing God. God continually pursues a love relationship with us that is real and personal. 
And you have to discover what this personal way God pursues you. Right? And he wants real relationship, not, you know, conceptual, ideal. Anything less than that is offensive to God as occult practices. Do not let uh, circumstances in life or people intimidate you to choose other than God's way, but trust Him and remember obedience is better than sacrifice. Do not get, you know, molded by the expectation of this world. Truly blessed life is only accessible through our intimate relationship with God. And I'm going to talk about prayer next time around and all that. How do we really pray? A lot of people think they pray, but they don't pray. Now all the people in the world pray to a certain extent. But to Christians, we pray differently. And that's that's where another secret for blessed life is. All right, why don't we close our uh, eyes and, uh, you know, I want you to think a little bit. And think about your life. Is there any part of your life you approach God with this plastic religiosity? Have some kind of formula in mind that you weren't even aware of yourself? If God is letting you know that part, this is a part that you want to repent. And that's offensive to God. And, and uh, you know, if you have never invited Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this will be the best time to do it. And it's very easy. Just under your breath, you just pray the prayer. I know my righteousness is not good enough. I trust in the righteousness of Jesus on that cross. So give me this eternal life that I may know you and follow you all the days of my life into eternity. Send me your Holy Spirit that I will be sensitized to hear your voice and obey and offer you my best. And I want this blessed life in my life. I want to experience you like never before. I want to see you move in power and majesty. Pray that prayer. God will answer that prayer. If you sincerely pray that prayer, God will answer that prayer. Next time around, if you have never prayed this prayer, but praying it today, next time around, get baptized. And those of us who prayed this prayer before, and yet our life is, has somehow uh, devolved into this reduction of God, and to religion repent and say to the Lord I want to walk with you I want to put up that energy and time so that I may have this precious relationship with you that I may walk into the blessed life that you have prepared for me God will also answer that prayer if you seriously pray that